Craig, that was really nice. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, thank you for that. Let me start off with a little verse from Psalms 113, verse 3. The ancient worship leader declared, From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen to that. This is why we're here. We're here to praise and worship our God and glorify Him today in worship. Thank you. Uh, today is a very special day. I want to welcome and say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, to all the grandmothers, and you know, ladies that who serve as mothers. There's a, a, a blessing in all of you, and the best kept secret in the world is mothers really make the world go around. I have to attest that uh, you know, I stepped up in the game in the last few months, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of details women do in life that I didn't realize, and I appreciate that, and I want to thank you, all you mothers, for that. Um, you do a lot that go uh, unappreciated. But as you leave the church, uh, ladies, uh, feel free to grab. There's a flower we want to hand you on your way out, so feel free to make sure you grab one of those on your way out as a token of appreciation. So please do that. All ladies can do that. I want to welcome those online, as always. Uh, uh, may God continue to bless you as you're watching today, now, or later in the day, or whatever. And as you know, everything's on our website, southlakesandybaptist.org, you can get the bulletin, and so forth like that. A um, couple things I want to note on your bulletin. Uh, Life and Light, uh, Wednesday night, the kids had their last night last week, so uh, the kids on Wednesday night are on break, so uh, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the adult youth group uh, meets Thursday at 6.30 for their final session this week for, for the summer break, so keep that in mind. Um, and, put that. and also in your bulletin, we want to highlight that we have our annual church meeting, Sunday, May 23rd, and that will be at 6.30, so put that on your, on your calendar. That's about this book. <coughs> Good, good morning. Also, uh, a, a kind of a correction or something that was omitted in your bulletin. I noticed uh, you'll see on there a softball is is back, and uh, it says where our team is, who our team is playing, and where our team is playing in the time. But it doesn't say the day. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday evening. So just so you know that that softball game is on Tuesday evening. Well, we're getting this out late. Uh, we just didn't get the materials uh, as soon as we, we should have, but I want to point out there's a display right there in the back on the table that's all lit up, and it is about the annual uh, Walk for Life that is a fundraising event for the Pregnancy Resource Center in, in Cambridge. And you can participate in the Walk for Life. It is, again, it's coming up quickly. It is next Saturday, uh, May 15th, and this year it's going to be held at the uh, Bluebird Park in Isandy. And uh, it's, it's a two-mile walk, very easy two-mile walk. And the way this works is you pick up one of these forms at the back. Uh, you, get, you ask people to, uh, to sponsor you. And so you ask people to sponsor you. You put down their name, their, all their information, and then you turn that in. You don't do anything more. You don't collect the money. You just turn in that information that lists the people that are sponsoring you. Now, you can register for this in uh, 
of three ways. Uh, you can go online to the uh, Pregnancy Resource Center of Cambridge, and you can register online, you can pre-register. Uh, you could call them, you could call the number, or you could mail in uh, the form that's on here. I think you could probably come that day with it too, but you, 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 uh, you register, and you just bring this uh, sponsor sheet with you. And so it is next Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 15th, um, yeah, you can register there at 9 a.m., and the walk begins at, at 9.30, and these informational pieces are the back there uh, on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Thank you for mentioning about softball. We did have our first game last week. It didn't go so well, but uh, we'll, get, we'll get it going, so don't worry. But please come this week, this Tuesday, and saying that would be great. Um, any other announcements? Let us look to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Lord Jesus, Lord, thank you for the glorious day that you made and that we can fellowship and praise you and sing your worships, Lord Jesus. Lord, let's lift up this congregation and as always, Lord, our mind and thoughts just focus on you, the words that you have to say to us, the songs that are singing, Lord Jesus, that all glorify you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for those that can't make it, Lord, and Lord, we also pray for those that are here, too, Lord Jesus, that we can raise up all as a body of Christ, no matter where we are, Lord Jesus. We all together worship you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Would you please stand and glorify God with us as we sing, as we worship through song?
had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like, like sheep without a shepherd. Lord, as we sheep, we are prone to wander. How often do we follow our own paths, the paths that do not bring us true refreshment, but bring us to dry wells. Like sheep, when we stray, we cannot find our own way home. As your sheep, we must gladly confess our need for you, our great and good shepherd. Come with us back to the place of your future. Please bow your heads for a moment to start your question. We hear the good news. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Please stand again and join us. great to look out here um, in our room and see that we are really pretty full today. And that is a wonderful uh, thing to see. We're glad that you are here with us on this beautiful Mother's Day. And we're also very happy for any of you who are joining us in the live stream right now or maybe watching later on YouTube. We're glad that you are doing that. Now, for those of you who have not been here with us in person, you, you should know that we have been very conscientious about maintaining our uh, safety and following the, the protocols that have been called for. Uh, and I look out every week and I see uh, people wearing your masks, and I appreciate that very, very much. And uh, we have maintained uh, social distancing. I also know, because you told me, uh, for many of you, as I look out and I see you, I know many of you have been vaccinated, and I, I'm happy for that, and I want to encourage those of you who, who haven't 
to take advantage of the many opportunities we, we have in our community. Uh, it, there's just um, just a plethora of places now where uh, you can go, the, uh, the drug stores and other places, and, and you can avail yourself of that vaccination. And the two things that are making a difference right now in our state are the increasing number, increasing number of people who have been vaccinated and the fact that we are continuing to practice these precautionary uh, measures. We'll be saying more uh, going on about the changes that are, are coming up that the governor announced this uh, past week. There are some changes, and we'll be saying more about that uh, later on. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible to uh, the Gospel of John, continuing in our series in John, and uh, we are going to be in John chapter 14. We were here last week at the looking at the very opening of the, the first uh, three verses, and we're going to pick those up, but we'll be concentrating today on uh, verses four through uh, seven. So, uh, John 14, beginning in verse one. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And we just bow together in prayer. Father, we graciously, we come to you because you are gracious. We come before you not because we are good, but because you are so loving and kind that you have invited us to come through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of a beautiful day. We pray your blessing on our, our mothers, and we thank you for them. And may they be strengthened and encouraged on this day. Father, now as worshipers, we offer ourselves to you as hearers of your word. O oh Lord, give us ears that will hear, minds will be open, and hearts will be turned. Move our wills in obedience to you. And Lord, may you be glorified in us. And Lord, as a result of our worship, may we be more open, more susceptible to the, to the leading of the Holy Spirit to make you known, to share the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you were to be in... Uh, Oregon, and you were to take the uh, expressway over on the east side of, of Portland that goes over the Willamette River, you would cross something that's called the Markham Bridge, and it's a it's it's a two-decker freeway, two-decker freeway that crosses the Willamette River, and as you were going over there, you you might catch. The, a, a glimpse coming off of that bridge, you might catch a glimpse of an exit that just juts out and stops. It's blocked. But as you go over that bridge, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ramp, like an off-ramp coming off of the Markham Bridge that just juts out and it stops. It goes off to the northeast. If you were able to stop there and look at that, you would see that that, that off-ramp that just goes off and abruptly stops is pointing towards the direction of Mount Hood. Now, when that expressway was built, the, the plan was that there was going to be an expressway that was going to come off of that, it was going to come off of that, and it was going to bring the traveler all the way up to Mount Hood. But the funding didn't come through for that part of it. 
So the beginning of the off-ramp to the Mount Hood Expressway is there, jutting out from the bridge, but it goes nowhere. So if you were to stop there, and if you were to be at that point where that off-ramp goes off and, 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 and ends, and you were to look off in the distance, you could see it sort of pointing towards Mount Hood, which you would have to say to yourself, you can't get there from here. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is not a way to get there. You can't get there from here. Well, a much more important question than how, how could you get to Mount Hood from the Markham Bridge, a much more important question is, uh, how do we get to God? How do we get to God? Now, you and I as Christians may say, well, we, we, we have the answer to that. Well, can we articulate that answer? Can we, can we express it? Or maybe you're a person who, who you're actually, if you were honest, you're wondering about that. How, how do we get to God? There are many people who are at that place in their lives. There are many people that, that you know, and I know, who really, when it comes down to it, they, they don't know the answer to that question, how, how do we get to God? Many people are searching today. Many are people. Many people are exploring a lot of different options, world religions, different types of spiritualities, etc., trying to find what, what is really, what is the way to God? Jesus shows us the answer to that question in this, in this text. Now, there are two vital needs that are in view in what we just read. There is the need for his disciples, there's a need for comfort in the face of a fearful future, and there's a need to know with certainty for his disciples, and for us, there's a need to know for certainty how can God be known. Now last week we looked at verses 1 through, through 3, and we saw how the Lord Jesus was responding to the very real, very real need of his disciples. In verse 1 he said to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why did he say that? You know, from what we saw last week, he said that because their hearts were very troubled. They were very anxious. Jesus had just said to them, it was like a bombshell dropped in their midst. Jesus had just said to them in chapter 13, moments before, he said, I'm going to be leaving you. And where I'm going, you cannot follow now. And it's an understatement to say they were, they were in fact deeply troubled. They had given up everything to follow Jesus. Their lives were centered on Jesus. He was the glue that held them together. Their, their mission was following him and being his disciples. And Jesus just said, I'm leaving where I'm going right now. You can't follow. So he speaks these words of comfort. And he says, first of all, you need to trust me. And just as, just as you trust God, the Father, you need to trust me. He puts himself on that equal plane with the Father. And he says, you need, you trust in God, you trust in me. And here's the deal. I'm going, but where I'm going, which is the Father's house, is what he calls it. He says, I'm going there, and he gives them some promises. He said, I'm going there to prepare a place for you, a dwelling place for you in my Father's house. And if I'm going there, and I'm going to prepare that place specifically for you, my disciples, that means I'm going to come back, I'm going to return, and I'm going to bring you to that place to be with me. So, he spoke to this very real need of his disciples, telling them, do not fear, do not be troubled, you can trust me, and here are the promises I'm making. Then... Jesus added in verse 4, you know the way, you know the way to the place where I am going. Now that's a very interesting statement. You know the way to the place where I am going. Well, it's more like, well, you ought to, you ought to, but do you really? Now, Thomas, one of the apostles, asks a very reasonable question, and I just appre I appreciate Thomas. Wherever you see Thomas speaking, he's just speaking just honestly, honestly. He just, he's, Thomas is one of those people who kind of asks the question that other people won't ask. 
You know, it's one of the things I appreciate when, you know, in, the, in Bible studies, like when our adult Bible study on, on Thursday night. Oh, by the way, Joe, thank you for the great compliment you paid to our adult Bible study when you said the adult youth group on, 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 on Thursday night. That, that, I, that, that just lifted me up. Um, you know what? I, 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 like to, I, I like to ask some questions that people are going to have to think about a little bit before they answer. But I also appreciate it when, when someone asks a question, because I figure when someone is brave enough to actually ask a question, they're probably asking a question that other people have. Other people have that same question, but they're just too, too timid to ask. Well, anyway, Thomas asks a very reasonable question. Jesus had just said, you, Jesus had just said, you, 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 know, you know the way to the place where I am going. And I can imagine Thomas shaking his head as he, as he says this, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? I love the honesty. We don't, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Thomas, Thomas is thinking, I, this is how I picture what's going on in Thomas's brain. He, he, he's saying to Jesus, look, you're not, you're not talking about going to Galilee. You're not talking about going to Damascus. You're not talking about going to Rome. You said you are going to your father's house. And Thomas is thinking, I'm not the brightest. I, I may not be the brightest bulb in the lamp, but I know that what you're talking about is not in this world. When you're talking about you're going to your father's house, you're talking about something that is, that is not in this world. So Thomas just very honestly says to Jesus, we don't know the destination, and we don't know how to get there. Now, the question then before us is, how do you get there? How do you get to the Father? How do you get to a place of intimacy with, with the living God? How do you get to the Father's house? How do you get to heaven? Very, very, very important question. Perhaps the most important questions in, in, in some of the most important questions in life. How do you get to God? How do you get to be with Him? Now, the answer to the question is not a map. It's not a religious system. It's not some kind of inner guide, some kind of light that you have within you to, to lead the way. The answer to the question that Thomas raises, the answer to the question is the person, the person of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ. So hear carefully what the Lord Jesus is saying. He makes an astounding claim, and what, he, what we have in verse 6 is the sixth of the seven I am statements. Seven I am statements. You can kind of, you can kind of hang everything that John is doing in this gospel around these seven I am declarations. This is, this is number six. Clearly before us, Jesus says in response, I am the way and the truth and the life. So notice first that the Lord's claim is comprehensive. It is so comprehensive. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Three claims. But I think we ought to, we ought to look at it in, 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 in this light. Three claims, but the first, the first, I am the way, is the direct answer to Thomas's question. Remember, that's what Thomas asked. How can we know the way? The direct answer is Jesus saying, I am the way, and the next two things that he says, and I am the truth, and, and I am the life, serve the first claim. I am the way. Those two things serve the the first claim and make the first claim possible. How is he the way? How is he the way to God? Well, you see, there is a problem. There is a problem. And the problem is universal. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all, everybody, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the religious, the poor, the rich, all 
have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's the universal problem. There's the universal need. And in our rebellion, as human beings, and in our rebellion, and in our sin, what do we do? We run. We hide. We run and we hide. And, 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 and if we have the thought in our mind, if we have in the thought of, of, of our mind that I, 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 I want to go to God, I, 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 I want to go to God, there, there is a barrier. There is a barrier that exists for sinners to come to God. Just like in the, in, in the temple that stood there in Jerusalem when Jesus was saying this. In the temple, there was a barrier between the place where you could come in as a worshiper and the, the holiest of holies, that, that part of the temple that represented the, the very presence of God, that God would manifest his presence there. There was a barrier. There was a veil. There was a wall. There was a... Physically, there was something there that signified to the worshiper, you cannot come just as you are. As a human being, you cannot come just as you are into the presence of God. There must be a mediator. There must be a priest. There must be a sacrifice because there is, there is a barrier. The reality of our sinfulness means we cannot approach a holy God. So what do we need? We need a way. We need a way. We need a way to Him. Imagine with me, or imagine that you, uh, you you decide to get in your mind, I, I really want to see the President. You know, I, I, I want to see the President of the United States. You're going to go to Washington. You get, you get there, you go there all the way with the idea that you're going to see the President of the United States. I'm, I'm telling you the likelihood that you're going to see the President of the United States is almost zero. There are all kinds of barriers. You're not, you're not going to get through the gate to the White House. You're not going to get past the security. You're not going to get into the West Wing. You're not going to get near the Oval. There's an old uh, Jimmy Stewart movie I remember watching uh, years ago. I think it's the one that's called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And, uh, Jimmy Stewart's character, and this, this would be back in the 1930s, and back when Roosevelt was the president. He, he's, he's determined he's going to go. He's going to represent it. I think he's going to represent his town or something, but he's determined he's, he's going to go to Washington. And uh, he, he gets there, and he actually gets into the White House, which probably back in those days might have been uh, possible. He actually gets into the White House. And he says he wants to see the president, and they say, no, he can't. You know, he, he can't see the president. Uh, you, have to, you, know, you have to go through his uh, appointment secretary, and, and, and you know, but you're, just, it's, you're not going to get an appointment. But he comes into this room, and he sees all these uh, their reporters that are going in for a press conference with the president who's in his office. And he goes in there, and he sees all these reporters, and they just have gone over, and they've taken off their hats. And there's this great big table, and they take it off their hats, and they put their hats on the table, and then they, they're just walking in to the president's office. So Jimmy Stewart just kind of looks at that. He, he looks at that table, and he, walk, he sees what they're doing. He's got his hat on. He just walks over, takes his hat off, puts it with all the other hats, and walks in. Walks in. In reality, you wouldn't be able to do that. Now, Jesus declares, I'm the way. I'm the way. I'm the way to know God. I'm the way to know the Father. I'm the way to his house. And Jesus, listen, Jesus is actually the way because he is the truth. So he says, I am the way and the truth and the truth. He is the way because he is the truth. Notice, Jesus doesn't say, I will, I will show you the truth. He doesn't say, I will point you in the direction of the truth. He doesn't even say, I will give you the truth. He says, I am the truth. Personified. Now, this is something that we've, we've seen before in, in John. If, if we go all the way back, uh, if, if, if we go all the way back uh, to the beginning of, of John, we can see him... Or we can hear 
this statement being made of, of, about Jesus in John 1.14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He is this person who is full of grace and truth. And we can go over to John chapter 8. We can go over to, to, to John chapter 8 in our Bible. And we can again hear words that point us to the reality of Jesus as the truth. In John 8, 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth that sets you free is Jesus. The truth that sets you free, he says, is being my disciple. It comes from, it comes from following, it comes from following me. Jesus is the way because he is the truth. And if we, um, well, there was another one, but I'm not going to go there. You see, Jesus is the way because he is the truth. Well, what does that mean? Jesus is the truth in the sense that he is the ground. He is, he is the basis. He is the source from which truth flows. He is, he is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Why, why do we have in our world, sinful and broken as it is, why do we have a concept of truth? Where does that come from? Is that a result of some you know, blind evolutionary process? Why, why do we have a concept of truth? We have a concept of truth because God is a God of truth and we have been made in his image and Jesus Christ is the personification of that. He is the ground. He is the basis. In him is only truth. In him is light. There is no darkness at all. So, we can know that Jesus is the way to the Father. We can know that with certainty because he is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way because he is the light. He is the light. Now, again, this is a key message in the Gospel of John. If you want to go back to chapter 1 and just walk with me up through John a little bit, this is such a theme that weaves through the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the way because I am the truth. And now we're seeing he is the way because he is the, he is the light, okay? John 1, verse 4. In him was life. One of the first statements John makes about Jesus. In him was life, and, the, and that life was the light of men. Go over to chapter 5. Chapter 5. Verse 26. 526. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to has to have life in himself. There is life in Jesus. He is the source of life. There is life in Jesus. Then go over to chapter 6. Not very far away. Chapter 6 and verse 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. There is life. And then, of course, in chapter 11, the previous I am statement that we have seen, the fifth I am statement, John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Now, that message goes all the way through John. Just what Jesus is saying here. I am the life. And starting way back at the beginning, John was pointing to that truth again and again and again and again. Jesus as the source of life. Why is that so important for us? Again, because of our need. Because of our greatest need. What's our greatest need? Well, Romans, the first part of Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin, remember we saw earlier, all of sin, 
And then Romans 6, 23, the first part says, but the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians now, who, who have been brought to light, now believers, now disciples, but he, he reminds those Ephesian believers in chapter 2 and verse 1, you were past tense. You were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And dead people can't do a whole lot for themselves. So you weren't made alive because of your effort, you Ephesian disciples. You weren't made alive because of your effort. You weren't made alive because you got really religious. You were made alive because God in grace made you alive, made you alive. He gave you life, and that life came to you through the person of Jesus Christ. In him was life, because that is our greatest need. Romans 5, in Adam all die. In Adam all die. We all come into this world physically, physically alive, but with bodies that are destined to die. But we come into this world spiritually dead. Inability to connect with God. Inability to find that way. We to find that way to him. It is literally true for us in our natural selves, apart from the salvation of Christ, it is true for us that we can't get there from here. We can't get there from here. So you see, Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus to be the way. Remember Thomas's question? How can we know the way? Jesus says, I'm the way. Okay? For Jesus to be the way, he must be the truth, and he must be the life. So look at his comprehensive claim. Put it all together. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Now we see the Lord, we see that the Lord's claim is, the Lord's claim is exclusive. It is exclusive. Verse 6 again. I am the way and the truth and the light. And then he adds, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that's logical when you think about what he's just said. I'm the way. And if I'm the way, then it's logical that he would say, no one comes to the Father but through me. And again, this is not the first time that Jesus has, has indicated that there is an exclusive, that there is an exclusive way. Matthew chapter 7, much earlier on, much earlier on, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, there, there is a narrow road that leads to life. There is a narrow road that leads to life. There is, there is one way. There's a narrow road. In John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says, I'm the door. He didn't say, I'm a door. He didn't say, I'm one of many doors. He said, I am the door. There is no other. There is, there, there is no other path. There is no other way. There is no other door. Now, this is where, when, when this claim, when we, when, we, when we speak this claim out, when we speak this claim out, to, uh, to, to the world, the, these words of, of Jesus, no one comes to the Father but through me, there's pushback. There's pushback. And it's not surprising. You make that statement as a Christian, you, you know, you, you can say that as you're sharing the gospel, this is so important because there is no other way. Here's the good news of how you can come into a relationship with God and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ, and, 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 and there is no other way, and there's going to be pushback. Some people are going to say to you, well, you know what, you, you're just very, you are being very narrow-minded. You're being very narrow-minded. And, and isn't, that, isn't that kind of an arrogant thing to say? Isn't that kind of an arrogant claim to say that there's no other way except through, through Jesus? Isn't, isn't, isn't that intolerant? There's actually a contemporary movement today that is found, unfortunately, in some churches, 
non-evangelical churches, but there's a movement called progressive Christianity. Now, progressive Christianity has several tenets to it, but one of the tenets of progressive Christianity is the statement that Jesus is one of many ways. Jesus is one of, Jesus is a way, but Jesus is one of many ways. That is a direct contradiction to what the Lord Jesus Christ says here. There is no other way. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if we say that, we're going to be called narrow-minded, we're going to be called arrogant, we're going to be called intolerant. So it's very important that we think through how we respond to this. And let me give you four things that I think need to be part of the response to this. When, when you encounter the pushback, and if you actually share this, you're going to get pushback from, from people. But I think we need to respond and I hear four ways I think it is helpful. First of all, to understand, this has always been offensive. This is not new to the 21st century. This has always been offensive. So when Peter and John, early in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4, are called before the, the, the Sanhedrin, the highest judicial body in Israel, and they're called before the Sanhedrin, this very powerful group, and they are told in John chapter 4, that you need to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they say, we ought to obey God rather than men. We can't follow what you're saying. And then they make this incredible statement. There is, and why are we going to continue preaching? Jesus, Peter says, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other but Jesus. Do you know what that was to the, to the Jewish religious leaders? Do you know what that was to the Sanhedrin? That was offensive. That was offensive. So then the apostles go out from there, and they begin to go out into the broader uh, Roman world, and they encounter all kinds of cultures. And when they're going out, you know, up through Asia Minor and finally in, into Europe, they're not bringing the message of Jesus into some kind of religious vacuum. They're bringing it into a very religious world in which there's all kinds of religious beliefs. But they're saying, there's only one way, and that way is Jesus. And did they get pushed back? You bet they got pushed back. They got all kinds of pushback. They were persecuted because of that. They were persecuted because they, they said, well, you, you, you can't tell us that, because if, if, if you're saying that to us, then you're saying all of our gods are, are false and, and, and we're wrong, and they got pushed back. So understand, first of all, that this claim has always been an offense. That's not new. Secondly, secondly, you need to be able to communicate with people. The church did not invent this. Because sometimes people uh, get the idea, well, you know, you, you, you Christians, you, you, you Christians came up with this intolerant, a narrow-minded view that says, you know, Jesus is the only way, and no one, no one can get to God in, in, except by this path. And you have to say, no, wait a minute, hold on. Hold on, we didn't invent this. These words came from the lips of Jesus. So you got a problem with this. Your problem isn't with the church. Your problem is with the Lord Jesus Christ because he, he said it. Third thing you need to bring into this, if you're responding to uh, the pushback, that this is a narrow, bigoted view to say that Jesus alone is the way to God. You can answer in this way, it isn't narrow-minded if it's true. It isn't narrow-minded if it's true. Now, several years ago, I had contact with a person who had a, was an older teenager and had terrific headaches. Just had, as they got older, they started having just terrific, horrible headaches. The doctors couldn't diagnose them, couldn't diagnose it. Finally, they went to a, uh, you know, neurology, <coughs> neurologist in the Twin Cities, and they did scans and everything, and they discovered that this person had at the, at the back of his brain, where all these blood vessels come into the brain, at the back of the brain, that these blood vessels were just kind of all knotted up. They were just kind of all knotted up together at the back of the brain. He'd been born with that, but for some reason, it didn't become a problem to, to this age. 
and the, and, and, and the pain was horrendous. And he's referred to a neurosurgeon at one of the leading hospitals in the Twin Cities, and the neurosurgeon said, can't touch it. It's just, it's too complicated. I, it would be too risky to try to do surgery on this and untangle this, these blood vessels. It, it can't be done. Well, they waited for a while, and they said, okay, well, let's, let's try Mayo, you know? Top specialist in the world. They, they, they went down to Mayo. Neurosurgeons at Mayo looked at the, you know, the MRI, looked at the scans. Neurosurgeons at, at Mayo said, can't do it, can't do it. It's too, it's too risky, we can't do it. And then later, one of the neurosurgeons on the Mayo team came, came back to this, this young man and his family and said, um, there is actually one person, I know of one doctor in the United States who has done this surgery. It's the only one I'm aware of. And he said, Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore. So, he said, I can make the referral. I can set you up if, if you want to try it. So, you know, he, he made the referral, and they went out to Johns Hopkins, and they were getting ready to see the surgeon, and his assistant was, uh, you know, doing an exam and, and evaluating the materials before the surgeon came in. And, and this, this guy's parents said, wow, we're just so fortunate to... We're, we, it's fantastic to know that there is, there is one doctor, there is one doctor in the country who's done this surgery. And the assistant said, well, let me correct you. That's not entirely true. He's not the only doctor in this country who's done the surgery. He's the only doctor in the world who's done the surgery. So if, if, if that claim was, was made, this is the only doctor in the world who, who does this surgery, would that be a narrow-minded, intolerant claim? No, it wouldn't be, because it's true. It just, it just happens to be true. There isn't anybody else who does it. And so the claim of, of, of Jesus, that he is the way and the truth and, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, is not arrogant or narrow-minded if it's true. And then you could say, let me show you why it's true. It's true because of what he did. It's true because he died on the cross and rose again. And, the, and his resurrection, which was attested to by hundreds of people and changed, has changed lives for 2,000 years, the reality of Christ's resurrection attests to the truthfulness of who he is. So, no, that would be number three. It isn't narrow-minded if it's true. And number four is this. We... We, can, we need to speak this truth. We need not to shy away from it. Uh, Jesus' statement, no one comes to the Father except through me. We need not shy away from it, but we also need to not speak it with arrogance or anger. We need to speak it gently and in love. We need to say things like, you know, there's a way that you can know God, and that is through the person of Jesus Christ. And when you look at his life, and you look at what he taught, and you look at what he did, and you look at what happened in his death on the cross, it's, it's, and his resurrection, it's really pretty obvious, isn't it? There's no one like him. There's no one like him. Yes, his claim is exclusive, but it's backed up by the reality of everything he did and everything that he, he said. And then finally, we see the disciples' certainty. The disciples certainly. Verse 7, Jesus said, If you really knew me, if you really knew me, if you know me, you know my Father. If you know me, you know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him and, and you've seen him. Now that leads to another question, and that's for next week. That leads to a whole other question about the relationship of Jesus with, with the Father. But, but, but here's the impact of this. Jesus Jesus promises to, to them, there is a way. There, there, there is a way for you to have intimacy with God. And Jesus gives them this certainty. You can know the Father. You don't need another human mediator. You don't know a priest. You don't need a priest to introduce you to him. You can, you can know the Father. And so he is giving them a confidence. Listen, he's giving, a, he is giving them a confidence about their relationship with God, their relationship with the Father. You can know the Father. Why? Because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the bridge to knowing him. Jesus says, if you know me, 
If you know me, you know the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. You're in relationship. You're there. You're no longer on a you're no longer on a bridge that goes nowhere searching. If you know me, you know the way. And you know the truth. And you know the light. And you can know the Father. So the question for us is how do these truths Im impact us? Do we grasp the importance? Do we grasp the depth of what Jesus is saying? There, there, is, there is a way to know God. And we, we get to share that. We get to tell that good news. There is a way that you can know God, that you can enter the, into a personal relationship with Him. There's a way that you can know life, real life, abundant life, eternal life. There is a way that you can know truth in a, in a, in a world where, man, truth is a rare commodity. We need to let the reality of what Jesus says here soak into our minds, into our being. And then we, you and I, we have to become good news translators, Bible translators. We need to be able to translate that into our world. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, I thank you for the revelation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We would not know you were it not for your son. We would be like Thomas forever asking, how could we know the way? But Lord Jesus, you and you alone can say, I am the way. And you are clearly the way to the Father, the way to life, the way to relationship with God, the way to heaven. You are the way because you are the truth. And you are the life. And Lord, may this grip us, change us. May we be open to how the Holy Spirit would use us to communicate this wonderful life. Please handle this one last time.
from Jude chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.